And uh, thank you for my uh, colleague, Kurt Spresser here. He works uh, directly with uh, G.A. Larson, Gustave Larson. We have numerous G.A. Larson uh, folks helping host. <laughs> well, you are hosting and we are presenting and then uh, we're gonna have some food across the street at the end of all this. So we're gonna go run through the presentation. We'll have um, uh, some QA sessions. So you can really dig in deep. We can walk around and turn some of these on. Um, but I mean, really it's it's to, to hear, see, feel um, how the systems work and, and ask whatever questions, deep dive questions you have on these. So I'll just dig right in. Sean, real quick. Yes, sir. For those of you guys here, snacks in the back, the yeah. fridge is stocked uh and restroom is out this door or out that door directly behind this room yes and no offense if you want to get up and, and uh grab a uh, bite to eat or or whatever just and bring up questions uh as we go and we'll just make it make it through all this i tried to add in some useful information but i uh also like to start with why why we're all here today why we're you know what motivates us to to do the work that we do and on the left side of this you'll see but there's a lot of different reasons why, you know, pick your own. For me, I like to focus on, this is one of my big whys, right? So waste not, want not. We could talk for a week about this slide, but I'm gonna focus in on a couple things. At the top, this is the estimated US energy consumption in our entire economy in 2021. The 2022 numbers are just now coming out, but uh, I had the slide set up for this. So. One or 97.3 quads of energy used in the entire economy. One quadrillion BTUs is a gallon of gas burned every second for 264 years. Now that's a lot of energy, but every second for 264 years, but there's 97 of these things in the US economy. So I, okay, but that's what it takes to run the economy. What I'm interested in is the fact that we waste most of it, right? We waste two thirds of the energy that we pull out of wherever, and it just goes away in heat and noise and all sorts of other ways that we are sort of uh, rejecting that energy back to effectively the, the environment one way or another. But I think we can do better than that. So that's why I do it. I, that's my one of my big whys. Um, here's a picture of power uh, electrical generation over the past uh, 70 years, I apologize, slightly out of date slide, but what I wanted to sh identify here is that uh, coal has been dropping down, natural gas uh, going up, and renewables is the other energy source uh, coming up. And I will group those together, whether it be solar or wind or ground source or uh, tidal or whatever we're, we're looking at, that that mix of, of, uh, of power generation, I think is just as important. And I also wanna point out that I don't see natural gas going away anytime soon. It's gonna to continue to be an important resource for us. I just wanna waste less of it, like the, just the previous slide, right? So uh, the utility companies in Colorado are really looking at those renewables in a big way. So the red half of that pie is Excel Energy and they provide power to more than half of the ratepayers in the state of Colorado. But across all the rest of those, those colors on the chart there, on the left side, Tri-State Energy, Platte River Power, Holy Cross, Colorado Springs, Black Hills, they're all looking at going to 80% renewables or beyond by the end of this decade. So they are clearly planning the message around shifting towards other resources, um, and in particular, uh, focusing on zero carbon energy production, right? So it's just a change in the market for how we get our power. This slide to me sort of sums up the variable costs that are associated with power uh, supplies as well as the electricity um, compared to, to the, the other fuels that we have. So if you look at this, the green, the electricity, what we're seeing a little bit of variance in that price of electricity across those months, but it's nothing compared to the other costs of, of energy. What I wanna point out here too is electricity cannot be exported. We don't export electricity to other parts of the world. We do export that the other uh, fuels to other parts of the world. That makes them a global commodity. And so we are beholden to the prices that people are paying for energy in Europe, in Ukraine, in 
uh, uh, Asia, in um, India, et cetera. So they're paid, they're buying more of it and they're paying more for it. And that's where those prices are starting to see those increases. Um, now, in this room, real quick, who's, uh, who's from the Colorado Green Building Guild or, or a member of the, of the guild in the room? All right, one, we got a couple more. All right, we probably have a bunch of folks online. Um, hey, buddy, how you doing? Uh, so we have some builders that are familiar with uh, the with the uh, challenges and opportunities with building codes. What I want to point out for everybody else is that that line, that white line that's coming down from the top left, heading towards towards the bottom right, those are code levels that we've seen over the past few decades. And the dashed lines, that little wedge of dashed lines coming down towards that bottom right corner, that's all heading, that's all taking us towards this net zero kind of end game on our buildings, right? So it's reducing the loads by building code and then adding in um, sources of energy, renewables on top of that. But that's sort of the trajectory that we've been seeing. It's the trajectory that's forecasted. And I, I, whether or not it's at the top of that line or at the bottom and we get there faster, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but I don't think that that path or that trajectory is changing anytime soon. So this is a different way to look at, looking at residential new construction uh, and the heating fuel in multifamily buildings on the left and heating fuel in single family buildings on the right. Clearly electric um, heating sources are on the rise and the, uh, the, the gas uh, heating is uh, declining over time, depends on what kind of building you're looking at, but it's a pr pretty clear uh, change. So now we think, okay, well, how are we doing that? Well, clearly we're talking about heat pumps today and uh, the orange line, the orange dash line is furnaces. The blue uh, circle lines there uh, is air conditioners and that green line, solid green line is heat pumps. So what I want to point out there is that inflection point, that tipping point that we're seeing the past few years, past couple of years, that furnaces are, are, are declining and heat pumps are increasing. So we've sold more heat pumps in the United States than furnaces in the past couple of years. And what can heat pumps do that furnaces can't? They can cool. Right. So of the 14 million or so uh, pieces of equipment that are represented, represented on this chart by HRI, heat pumps can do both of those things. So pretty soon heat pumps are going to be doing almost all of that. I would, and I'll, I won't say all of it because I think there's always going to be some systems out there, uh, but it's going to be a pretty uh, single digits for sure. Because we can see this change in the rest of the world as well, right? Variable capacity heat pumps have already dominated the market in other parts of the world uh, pretty substantially. And the United States is the growing market from, from a manufacturer's perspective, a global manufacturer's perspective. The United States is a huge business opportunity because it's low adoption and the rest of the world's already sort of gotten there and it, this is the next big way. So some basics. We're not talking about grandpa's heat pump here that rose up when it was modest temperatures. Out. This is not what we're talking about, right? That is That was a reality. Some equipment might still do that, depends on how well it's maintained, et cetera. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about variable capacity, cold climate heat pumps that move heat from where it is to, to where you uh, want to put it, right? So you can think of that as a refrigerator, right? A refrigerator is a heat pump. It's pumping heat out of the box into the house. And now we get to pump the heat out of the house and into the outside as it's 100 degrees outside. We also have zones. So this driver, you know, and lots of cars these days have the driver's side controls and the passenger side controls, some of them front and back, et cetera. So that's zoning. And then also that variable speed uh, driver, right? That variable speed uh, drill. I, I don't know that many people that still use a single speed drill these days. You just pull the trigger and suddenly it's on at full torque. And that we just, we've sort of moved past that. And I would argue that that's what we're doing with heat pumps as well. We're moving past the single and two speed equipment into variable speed because it does more for what we need. So looking at, I'm sort of, and I apologize to those in the room that, that do uh, carry and represent uh, or, or uh, work with 
single speed kind of the furnace split system, but that's why we're here, right? I'm here to talk about heat pumps. So I've grayed out the left side, which is gas and AC, um, focusing on the middle and the right, just comparing those two. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that, but the traditional heat pumps, which are those limited speeds and have limited capabilities because they do drop off in capacity as temperatures drop versus variable capacity, where all it's really doing is adding uh, pressure to the accelerator pedal, right? It's just adding more energy in to meet the need of the house as the temperature drops. So that sort of looks like this as well, right? So it can accelerate a little bit faster and it can maintain in that variable nature rather than that on-off cycle. So that's really a, a big piece of where the efficiency comes from. There's other components. There's uh, different, um, um, the magnets, for example, how the copper is wound, how the uh, how the, the refrigerant flows through the copper. There's lots of nuances that come into play in a higher efficiency systems. But fundamentally, it's the fact that we accelerate up to where you need to be, and then they sort of maintain and they step back in their in their demand for power. So looking at uh, ways to do heat pumps in the house, right? Single zone, multi-zones, and then bigger multi-zones. Um, branch box versus ported is really the, the, the key there. And if you look over here on your left, you'll see a branch box kind of hanging off that, that mobile display. And you see the pipes coming out the back um, and going to the different pieces of equipment. Um, a ported version does almost the same thing as that. It just doesn't have that branch box in. And that has to do with some technical details, but it allows us to get to more zones throughout the house with one piece of outdoor equipment. So uh, we can think of how are we breaking up that house by heat loads, right? Whether it be uh, heating or cooling load dominant, et cetera, we're moving beyond that block load that tells us how much heat has to be delivered into that box in the winter to maintain set point and how much cooling has to be delivered in there to maintain set point in the summer. We can break that apart to the zone kind of room by room or zone loads. So we're looking at the living room, the kitchen, the, bow, or the bedroom wing, whatever, what, however that house is broken up. Or we really can break it down uh, room by room and it really is going to depend on what the loads are. If they're, if it's an older house with higher loads, we might be able to do lots of independent, you know, ceiling cassettes or wall cassettes or what have you. But higher performance buildings, as those loads drop, you're going to start to run into some challenges with sizing because while they are variable, they're not infinitely variable. There are some limitations. But really, we're 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 thinking about all right. It's one room versus another, one floor versus another. How do we address how we live and what the exposures are? And this technology can, uh, is, uh, the good news is there's lots of ways to get there. The bad news is there's lots of ways to get there. So you have to sort of think a little bit more about how you're applying them, right? Um, and we do that with using manual J or something similar, similar um, uh, software tool. So, this really all this is doing, it's looking at what is the insulation level of the ceiling, of the walls, of the windows, the floors, what's your air leakage rate, and what do you have inside the house that's producing heat or taking heat away, it's ventilation, for example, um, or window, uh, sorry, uh, um, things you plug into the wall, people, the appliances, et cetera. All that gets worked into the, into the uh, manual J and comes up with a load. The goal is, to not oversize it and not undersize it, right? We're looking for that Gold, Goldilocks zone. And there are reasons for that uh, in terms of efficiency. There's a reason for that in terms of durability. Yes, these systems are variable. They're not infinitely variable, you know, from 0% to 100%. You're generally gonna find operations from the 25%, maybe 20% up to 100%, depending on what the need is. So we do need to think more uh, specifically about sizing that does matter. We have some flexibility, but finding that Goldilocks zone does matter. And there are tools that you can use. So you've got WriteSoft, um, Elite, other software tools. That all works with uh, Manual J, Manual S, et cetera. But along with those kind of guidelines for the industry, we have other tools like Diamond System Builder that can help you uh, be clear about whether this piece of equipment in this climate 
in this connection with these line sets and and you know this indoor versus that indoor is going to deliver the capacity the BTUs per hour to maintain comfort for that house and that's that diamond system builder it's a free software tool you can talk to any of the folks here in uh in at GA Larson or us with Mitsubishi about that um there's other uh, lots of other tools online uh we've got tech tips, you know, videos, there's actually, those will link into YouTube. We've got a whole YouTube channel. These, uh, the middle section here is application notes. Application notes help clarify some details. Maybe people have asked a lot of questions about and, and there's uh, better uh, guidance on, uh, on the uh, application notes, uh, tips and tricks and that kind of stuff, as well as um, the, just the equipment selection. So my link drive, has all of our technical specs, right? It's got the submittal sheets, it's got the installation uh, documents, it's got uh, service guidelines, it's got accessories and so on. So a really powerful online tool that I would say is probably at, at least at least as good or better than the competition out in the market. It's one of the reasons why people um, really respect how we do because we put it all out there. We're just we're just laying it out there. Like here's the information. Keith Keith over here on the on your right, he's in the he's in the uh, a Navy, Navy uh, short sleeve shirt there. Um, he is a technical genius. He works for GA Larson and he uses this tool every day. On my link drive, he drives, he takes people there to solve problems every day. Um, products that are coming out, um, the what we call the IntelliHeat or it's a case coil. Now you can put a heat pump on top of a furnace. That's a powerful combination. We're gonna be seeing a lot of those going forward that dual fuel application. I actually have one in my house. Um, we've got uh, new products coming out in terms of the wall units, um, looking at different, you know, kind of innovations kind of piece by piece, like that dual barrier coating, one of out of multiple points there, that dual barrier coating allows for um, keeping the coil cleaner longer. And so avoiding the buildup of, of um, moisture and debris and dust and all that stuff that can be a problem for indoor air quality in the long term. So it just extends the life of the of the health of that unit over time and helps people keep people healthy. Uh, you know, the, there's other features coming out. I wish we had time to go through them all, but that would be kind of boring. So uh, ceiling cassettes, you see one right there. That is actually a ceiling cassette. It's down at about five and a half feet high, but when you look up at it from underneath, you can see veins that are gonna blow air uh, down and out and left and right, active veins. Well, this is a new smaller version of that. And it's now instead of 9,000 BTUs, it's 6,000 BTUs. What does that mean? That means you can actually start to put a 6,000 BTU indoor unit into bedrooms and room by room. And that's not gonna overshoot. You're gonna have less of an issue. You're gonna have better sizing per room with that piece of equipment. Uh, that's going to be a, a really important one going forward. The smart multi, that large compressor that's on that cart right there, that is a smart multi unit, and it's either ported. Uh, actually, all the smart multis are branch box based. That is a really, really powerful compressor. That's um, it's it's three, three and a half, four ton. We actually have um, some some larger ones as well. They're not the larger one isn't hyperheat, but it's close. It actually performs pretty well. Um, but I will say that you're going to see a lot of those in the market, a lot of those going into uh, the Marshall Fire Rebuild, for example. You're going to see uh, these going into new home construction. These are going to allow for a very nice turn down so that you're not actually oversizing uh, when you start to zone with heads. So if you've got an existing home that has a pretty high heat load and you need to put a case coil in and take care of part of the house, or you want to put a ceiling cassette in the master suite, or sorry, the primary suite is the is the new term, right? It's not master anymore, it's primary. Um, so putting it in, you know, to take care of the, the envelope of the house, the insulation maybe isn't that great. It could be better, it's not that great. Maybe they do need a dedicated piece that's in them, the master or the room over the garage or whatever. You can do that with this smart multi uh, application without, uh, with less fear of, of oversizing or overshooting and that kind of thing. Really important piece. Um, adding value to homes. This is something that I came across recently. 
Um, I mean, there. when you start to think about those charts before that I showed you, those trajectories, where we're going in the industry, the move towards efficiency, the move towards net zero, zero carbon, et cetera, those are going to start to show up in value when people are doing uh, improvements on their home, right? So once you... Um, once the real estate industry and the uh, and the appraisal industry start to understand these things a little bit better and get comfortable with and have comps in the real estate transactions, those pieces of equipment that you are installing, you're specifying, or you're asking for uh, from your from your suppliers, that's going to start to show up on the house's uh, value. So that's kind of a big piece I'm excited about. So. Let's dig in on how they work. Great, that's great information, Sean. Thank you very much. Well, how do these things work? How do you get heat out of cold air in the winter when it's really cold air, right? We understand they can cool in the summer. We understand they can heat some in the winter, but, but show me. All right, I got you. We're going to start on the left here. This is, heat pumps work with refrigeration. Right? It's a refrigeration cycle, which sounds crazy to talk about. What does that really mean? The refrigeration cycle is on the right, but I'm going to start with water. Start with freezing water and boiling water. This chart right here, and I, you, the folks online probably, I'll be a little bit more clear for the folks online. That small rectangle, the blue rectangle underneath that, that um, piece of ice there, so it says 144. There's 144 BTUs per pound in that change from liquid to solid and solid back to liquid. Without changing temperature, there's 144 BTUs in that phase change. As we ramp up from freezing to boiling, there's 180 uh, BTUs per degree, uh, sorry, per pound per degree. No, not per degree. There's one BTU per degree, there's 180 degrees in that ramp up. But then we get to the boiling of water and there's 970 BTUs in the change of water uh, from, from liquid to vapor. And it's that those hidden boxes of heat, if you will, because it's not changing in temperature when it's at that temperature. It's just, it's just changing phase. It's that phase change that makes all the difference in how we put steam to work to build our civilization, right? How we use ice to create cooling and a ton of ice was uh, did uh, 12,000 BTUs of cooling, thus a ton of cooling. This is where all, all these things are related, right? This phase change is where the magic happens, right? So all we're really doing is applying that phase change to the refrigerants. We're not working with water anymore, we're working with refrigerants and we're moving that refrigerant around in that cycle. We're compressing it to add a little extra. Well, sorry, we're, we're, we're dropping on the left side, the blue side, we're dropping that refrigerant below the outdoor temperature so that if it's zero degrees outside, we're gonna drop that refrigerant down to, I don't know, negative 10 or something like that. Some degrees lower than outdoor temperature. As it's lower than outdoor temperature, it's gonna absorb heat out of that air and that heat is gonna move into that refrigerant and change its phase. But it's not just one degree we're capturing. It's hundreds of degrees. It's not quite as good as water, but it's hundreds of BTUs, hundreds of BTUs that we're absorbing into that refrigerant. And then we compress it, and then we drive it inside. We change its, its, its uh, phase absorbing heat, and we deliver that heat to the inside, and it changes back into a liquid. It changes into a vapor, holds all that hidden heat, we drive it into the house and we deliver that heat to the inside. And now it's dropping back down to a, to a liquid. So liquid to vapor, vapor to liquid. We're just managing the boiling point of that refrigerant through pressure and temperature. So that's a lot, but that's how it works. I did say, I warned you, this was a deep dive. So stick with me here. All right. So what that gets us is something called coefficient of performance. Now we can utilize that phase change to our advantage, like a pulley, like a lever. We can lift, if you've got the right pulley, you can lift 300 pounds with 50 pounds of force, right? With the right lever, you can lift however much you want over here with the right application and the right lever. This is sort of like a lever. We're applying this, this technology. 
So energy output, that's what we need for the house. Mm -hmm. Energy input is what we're paying for to come into the house. So now we get to multiply that. And it's, instead of having you know 60%, 80%, 95% efficient burning fuels, we've got 150%, 250%, 550% efficient and uh, energy efficiency on the heating side. That's the coefficient of performance. That's the refrigerant cycle at work. So how do we do that when it's really cold? There's a number of ways, but one key way is, I like the graphic, it sort of works. There's a lot going on here. We don't have to talk about it all, but that yellow circle identifies a key piece in some of our technology, and it's called a heat injection circuit. What it's doing is it's taking, it's capturing waste heat that's coming in after it gave up most of its heat indoors. It's now capturing the leftover heat as that refrigerant comes back through the cycle, right? So it's splitting the remaining refrigerant, uh, uh, vapor refrigerant from the liquid refrigerant. And it's using the liquid refrigerant to cool off the vapor refrigerant a little bit further. And we capture that remaining phase change out of that, um, out of that refrigerant that's on its way back outside. So one way that we're capturing a little bit more efficiency out of the system in an extremely cold environment. That only on hyperheat. That is a hyperheat application for us. Yeah, there might be, I mean, it's it, the, that theory applies to say a desuperheater for other products and applications. Um, we could talk for a while on it, it's pretty cool, but it's one uh, out of other things. Uh, there's other ways we sort of uh, run the refrigerant over the compressor. We, we remove uh, waste heat from running that high, uh, high energy, uh, high heat compressor. That heat isn't just compressing the refrigerant, it's actually hot and we use some of that heat to drive into the house as well. Um, now, we take this concept and we think about, okay, let's go back to this national, big national picture and we have a lot of movement towards heat pumps. NEP, NEEP, NEEP, Northeast Energy Efficiency Project. Um, is has created this heat pump list, cold climate heat pump list. It's a it's an amazing effort. It's a it's a Herculean effort. Um, and what's important to know is that you're going to start to see products listed on there that are uh, um, it's 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 helping show really useful information. Um, that said, there's one key area that I worry about as we head towards all this. That's 70% of the 47. That is, um, what that means is that the piece of, pieces of equipment, as long as they can deliver 70% of their capacity of the, their rated capacity at five degrees, right? If they, can, if they can continue to operate down to five degrees and still deliver 70% of their capabilities, that's fundamentally the, the nature of it. It's not entirely perfectly accurate, but it's close enough. The problem is, when does that system stop operating? When does that system need to be helped out by electric resistance? When does it need to be helped out by some other heating system? It's, it's good. It's a list of good and great equipment. And the challenge for, um, for specifiers or building professionals is to separate the good from the great that's on that list. So you still have to dig into the numbers. Right, so back to Diamond System Builder, that's how we look at, uh, that's how we verify what this system is gonna do at different design conditions. You can say, I wanna do uh, actually this, uh, th yeah, this system that you see, this Diamond System Builder, this is up in Leadville, right? So I've, I've entered in information for Leadville, Colorado, and this system that you see in the picture right there, a smart multi like that, with two ceiling cassettes and uh, um, um, a concealed ducted unit like on top of that, those three pieces of indoors. Now I can say, we're gonna get that much heat out of this system in those conditions with this configuration. And, that, and the HVAC contractor can be confident in that, the builder can be confident in that. And there's, there's tweaks to be fair, you know, like they didn't put in any, well, they did put in a gas, uh, fireplace, but the whole goal is that the builder wants to go all electric because he's putting solar panels on the roof, et cetera, and so on. That's the goal. 
Another uh, application that was sort of kind of a test case was up in steam, but or sorry, uh, uh, snow mass, snow mass ski area. And um, at the top of the ski lift, that's 11,300 foot elevation there. Uh, we were able to put a system in that uh, replaced 15 kW. One of those replaced 15 kW of electric resistance heat. So one third the power that it has to go into heat that building as opposed to uh, the 15 kW heat, um, electric resistance heat. So that's a win. We like that. What was a problem, and that's what you see in the in the right hand photo there, is that they didn't clear the snow away uh, properly enough, right? And so when they got five and a half feet of snow in nine days, it got it just got inundated with snow and it just couldn't keep up. So yes, absolutely, you got to keep the snow off of these things. You have to be thoughtful about these exceptional products because they're not perfect. They're not gonna. They will defrost themselves. They're not gonna clean the snow off from around them themselves. Anyway, what's a cost difference in something like that? Just for cost difference, like replace to operate. Yeah. Well, um, so electric resistance is the probably the most one of the most expensive ways you can heat a space. All right, we've all heard of that. So if we can drop that cost by two thirds, that's pretty valuable. The cost to put the system in, um, it depends on. I would say, I don't want to. I, when we get into dollars, it gets very slippery very quickly. But I will say, we have to like sell it to people that was dollar amount versus. Yeah, I will say that these systems that are here uh, will compete. If you were looking at sort of low end, medium, and high end, will compete at the medium, um, you know, sort of dollar for dollar, and will will compete and win at the high end if you're comparing apples to apples, so to speak. Capabilities, etc. Go ahead, Mike. So uh, my name is Mike, I do business development for Larson. <clears throat> and one of the projects that myself and Heat Sam actually have been working on is kind of a business case for heat pump for the standard split system. And using our pricing um, from like a train split system, furnace air conditioner, and the Mitsubishi uh, zone solution, uh, we're probably within, I'd say, $1,500 to $2,000 once you factor in all the rebates that are available at federal, state, and utility. So the gap. You know, 18 months ago it was pretty large with the like reduction acts that they call and so on. We've got to really close, make a much better case for uh, utility performance. Uh, the payoff would probably be within two years, two and a half years. Right so, Mike, is it so you, what I'm hearing you say is that the difference between sort of that traditional or standard system and the higher efficiency system, that gap is closing with the incentives that we're seeing in the market? Is that yeah, fair to say? I, yeah, I would say. Without rebates in play, you're approaching twice the cost. With the rebates in play, you're bringing it down. Do you foresee the rebate sticking out? The federal rebate has a sunset date of 10 years. The state rebate has a sunset of being the January 1st of two years. Colorado being Colorado, I believe that would get suspended. I can't predict that, but I think it would be. The utility uh, rebate has gone nowhere up uh, in favor of the consumer. So, Arguably, you could lose the state of Colorado rebate, but everything else along with the And that doesn't figure in the operating costs over time. Oh, right. So uh, here's that uh, house in, in Leadville. Um, we're sort of using that as a test opportunity as well. So I've spent some time up there refining. We're going to end up putting uh, uh, wind bathrooms on that, for example, because there's a lot of wind moving between those houses, et cetera. It's doing the job, they're comfortable. Uh, but they're finding when the wind blows, there's a, it, it struggles a little bit more. So just being thoughtful about applications, really. Here's a fun, fun way to look at uh, system operation when it's pretty cold. I apologize, I don't have a full set of data here. But uh, so this is uh, April, mid-April. So uh, April 14th, call it uh, midday. Uh, April 14th into midday, uh, April 15th. And you saw, you see it gets down to about 10 degrees there. It was snowing uh, the second half of uh, that Friday and into early Saturday. And you can see the operation. This is a hour by hour energy use of that system. Um, and so as you see the temperature drop, you see the energy use rise, right? It's sort of starting to ramp up and work a little bit harder to keep up with the heat load. Um, but I also want to point out that we're talking 
two, certainly less than 2.4, 2.3 kilowatt hours uh, per hour to heat that house, which just, it's not that much when you start to think about it, right? And this system is rated for, um, call it 5,500 watts, but it's running at less than half that when it's 10 to 20 degrees outside. So if it can do 50 or 60 degrees worth of work at less than half of its capacity, there's plenty to go, right? It can handle the, it can handle the, the, the what you're throwing at it. But there's details we got to work out on that, to be fair, like the wind outlet. Um, setup is important, right? How do we get, how do we take what we know can be true and we apply it and make it so, right? So it's selecting location, the indoor units, but I would say the two most important steps in here, two, two of the most important are on the right side there. It's the leak testing, pressure testing, and then the, the charge, right? So we, it, these, these systems are very dependent on managing that temperature and pressure of that refrigerant. So we have to be able to make sure that it can handle up to 600 PSI. That is, call it twice, roughly twice, what you're gonna see in a typical air conditioning system. So folks that have the tools and the knowledge to handle work on air conditioners, they sort of have to change their mindset a little bit and, uh, and change their, their equipment around to handle 600 PSI positive pressure tests, as well as triple evacuation down. And it's just a, it's just a different routine. So there are extra steps involved and extra uh, uh, details involved. Uh, and then the flares, connecting these pieces, that's really important as well. That's probably the number one warranty. Would you say, Keith? It's, it's all about charge, right? Yep. Yeah. I'm going to slide for these. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, applications in cold climates. Where can you put these outdoor units? So you wouldn't want to put it on a walkway, right? Where that that cold surface, the moisture, the frost, the freeze, the 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 snow condenses on that on that cold surface, and then it goes in a defrost, and that water drips down into a walkway and refreezes. You don't want to create an ice cream, right? That's a you don't want that, that water to refreeze on another piece below it. You don't want to mount these kind of one over the other because the lower one's going to suffer with that water dropping down and freezing on it. Just things like that. It's 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 not hard, but you just got to stop and think about some of these details. So outdoor unit location, thinking about wind, thinking about protection from snow, if you can get it. Um, and um, that said, these are tested in a gigantic freezer back in Atlanta. And so there's no sun in the freezer. So they're gonna do the job without any extra help. They're just testing their capabilities. But if you can get that outdoor unit located where it can see a little bit of winter sun and that winter sun can help manage that defrost, you're gonna be capturing the energy of the sun there for free. And you're not gonna to have to invest on your utility bill uh, to do that defrost, right? A little less noise, a little less uh, defrost cycling, a little bit more heat delivered, et cetera. So try to try to keep them in the sun. I would even say keep them out of the snow shadow, right? You know exactly where the snow shadow is at your house or where you, you can guess where it's going to be at your customer's house. Just try to keep it out of the snow shadow if you can. Uh, here's a defrost cycle. The, um, the red boxes there identify the... Uh, Five minute defrost, about five minutes defrost on my house. That is not a picture of the unit of my house, but it is a video. So when you get this, uh, this if you want, let us know. We can get you the PDF. In fact, we can share it with the CGBD crew um, and the Larson crew. Um, and really, all it's doing is just showing that yes, defrost happens. It's a thing in the winter, but. Uh, it may or may not slow down the, the ramp up or the recycling or what have you, but the system has its own logic and it goes into defrost when it needs to and then it stops. It's not like a timed thing. It's just not going to happen every 20 minutes or every hour on, on the hour kind of thing. It's going to happen when it needs to. It can tell that that's happening, uh, that it needs to happen. Uh, I'm not going to go into this one. This is about oversizing. I'm just going to, these are some fun photos. Uh, teachable moments, right? You don't want um, top left. You don't want the exhaust air from one to go into the, the intake air from the other, right? You're going to sort of have this cascading loss of capacity on that system. 
uh, the top right corner, you notice there's a copper line set there. Well, an AC installer put this in, not realizing that both sides need to be insulated, right? So they they pick the one with line set. Uh, bottom right hand corner, dust and debris during construction. That dust and debris is just gonna it's gonna what we call soil the coil, right? Uh, it's not a good thing. You're gonna lose efficiency. Try to try to maintain your filters if there is construction going on. Uh, air flows and connection issues and all that stuff. If you got ice showing up in the indoor unit, somebody wired something wrong. Cross wiring, we call it. Uh, so just using tools and resources, checklists to 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 make sure the work is is on par, right? Uh, I'm gonna move through these a little bit. I, well, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at this. So climate zone five, it's well established. Heat pumps can work well in climate zone five. I would say we've got systems operating in climate zone six and climate zone seven. That's the blue and the purple across the northern parts of the United States, as well as parts of Colorado. Um, and I showed you a few pictures of those in uh, Snow Mass and Leadville, et cetera. We've got them all across. Heat, you and I try to, we probably have 70,000 uh, hyperheats installed in Colorado, something like that. Yeah. Um, Fargo, North Dakota, average minimum daily temperature of negative 23 backup capacity is needed approximately 5% of the year, right? Sure, you might need it. You don't need that much of it. And for our systems, it doesn't have to be the entire load of that. So that's probably one piece that's a little bit uh, unique. For, for, for us, it's additive. Backup is on top of what the heat pump can already do. If these can operate at 60% and negative 25, you only have to make up that difference. You don't have to add the entire backup. Right? It's pretty important to think about. Uh, it's a fun video out of Ontonagon, Minnesota. 60 units, 15 buildings, 25 below zero and uh, without backup. Right? Pretty impressive stuff. And and the this is the, this was the utility company actually telling these folks that like hey don't don't run the new gas line this is all electric and it was expensive to run the houses don't run the new gas line to your community just put in heat pumps an efficient capable system uh, we can talk about cost effectiveness if you want let's come back to that because we can we can dive in. This was um, this is showing that price uh, variability. So the, the the high fluctuations in the cost of energy, uh, natural gas versus electric over the past 22 years or so. Uh, that peak that we saw in, in 2020, that's reflect or sorry 2022. That's reflected in my my bills on the right. These are literally from my utility bills. 2021, 2022, 2023, January rates and uh, the costs going up over time. So I felt it at my house. Yes, electric went up, but not as much as the gas did. Um, and I'm not saying it's always going to be there. I'm saying it is a commodity and it's going to change over time. And we're going to, I think we're going to see higher rates on gas fluctuating up and down. Um, as we go forward. Here's my dual fuel system. Um, I, I do have a furnace. I don't use it uh, because the heat pump outside takes care of it. So um, the I will say that I've knocked off 95% of my gas heating because I've got a beta version of, the, of this coil and then the beta version forces me to change over at nine degrees. But um, I still I still have 50% capacity left on my heat pump at nine degrees, sort of like that uh, other chart that I showed you. So I'm literally going to take out the furnace and I'm going to put in a regular air handler, basically just like that one right there, um, that that um, full size air handler. And I'm not going to have backup heat because I proved to myself that the system will do it. Another thing that I proved to myself, um, I'm going to jump ahead here. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead to this. Another thing I proved to myself is that the electrical loads we have in our homes are very conservative. Sorry, the, the electrical panel uh, load calculations that are done, right? The load forms, et cetera. How big does the panel have to be? How big does the circuit have to be, et cetera? They are very conservative. And I proved this out for myself. Uh, because I put in uh, an energy monitor. Emporia is a Colorado company. I opted with that one. 
and um, and I've been monitoring it. And I also put in an EV. And this this uh, on the top right photo there, that gray box next to the tan box or whatever color it looks like to you, um, is the is a smart switch. So I basically am running my uh, EV off of my dryer circuit, right? So I didn't change my panel. I just took, I looked at the fact that my dryer almost never runs and that's 30 amps and I'm charging my car with a 30 amp circuit almost always between 10 and 15 amps. I almost never run it all the way up in amperage. I just don't need to. And I monitored it, buddy. Uh, and I monitored it over 70,000 minutes of data over this winter. 70,000 one minute uh, segments of data. And what I found out is that my absolute worst case one minute data was 57 amps. That's with electric dryer, EV, all electric appliances, uh, heat pump, all that stuff. I, I have an all electric house effectively with an EV and the max amperage on my 100 amp panel is nowhere near my 100 amp limit, right? So I'm not saying that you should do this, saying that you might be able to do this, saying that I'm, we're starting to prove this out and identify that this is an opportunity or heat pumps without crushing our grids, okay? Because the grid's already built from a 100 amp panel and I'm not even touching the limit of it, fair enough? So um, looking at that, here's, uh, well, we'll jump ahead. Here's my dryer and my air source heat pump. Uh, and I would say the, the dryer EV combo circuit there. And those are by far the biggest usages and we're looking at a total um, usage time of um, mm, I would say of the max, the max amperages, sorry, the max uh, wattages are here. They're almost never even close to half of that of that max wattage. Uh, what is interesting also is that we start to think about, well, what are the other things in the house? Here's my range, my electric stove. The electric stove is rated for 9,900 watts, right? That's that's what it, what it says its nameplate will take. But the actual usage over three months of data say that there were literally three minutes out of 70,000 minutes that I was within 90%, sorry, I was not even within 90%, I was, I was basically at, at uh, half. I was running at about 4,500 watts out of 9,900. Three minutes out of 70,000, nowhere close to its rated max. There's more there, we can look back at that. So what's the whole point? The whole point is let's try some things out, but also use common sense, right? Yes, I've proven myself that I can push beyond the limits, but I'm gonna wait and see, first off, how my 100% uh, cold climate heat pump goes first. I'm taking out that air handler, taking out that furnace, taking out that, that coil, putting in a full-size one without backup, just to make sure everything's good, right? Uh, and then maybe I'll put on the flippers and start kicking around soccer balls and put in other stuff in my second EV or whatever. Now, um, real quick, um, IRA, tax incentives, et cetera. There's some great documents out there. The, this is actually available on our, on our website, um, mitsubishicomfort.com under, is it under resources and policies? Something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, so we can get it to you if you like. Um, for the builders, since this is sort of like, we were looking at this being Colorado Green Building Guild, the builder focus, 45L is a big piece of that. This is a currently active incentive program out there, tax um, tax structured program. And it's good for single family homes. It's good for multifamily homes. And it's uh, the one on the right is, uh, I believe, specific to the, um, the uh, uh, um, prevailing wage requirements that are applied to other parts of the country more than here. But um, some good opportunities, look at 45L, look at a HERS rating, look at Energy Star, look at Zero Energy Ready as a build to practice, uh, to drop the loads of the envelope, increase the comfort, increase the indoor air quality, 
And now you can increase the incentives. You can double it or, uh, or add the incentives that way you didn't have them before, maybe. And uh, GA Larson, a great provider, uh, works with builders and the new construction industry, and they've got locations around Colorado and they deliver. Um, so I will, I'll, I'll end with some, a couple little thoughts here. We've done hard things before, right? We have hard things ahead of us. We've done hard things before in 15, 14, yeah, 15 years. We moved rural U.S. farms from 10% electricity to, to 90, yeah, 80% electricity. 80% of farms had power at the end of that 15 years. Oh, and by the way, we fought World War II during that time, right? These are hard things, all done at the same time. A lot of people, a lot of resources, a lot of focus, a lot of effort. Um, here's another one. And now, if you believe that this happened, it happened. <laughs> it, it happened in 14 years. And by the way, during this time, we also quadrupled the amount of power on the U.S. power grid. We've done hard things before. We can do them again. So thank you for your time. So you're ready to rock. Or <laughs> okay, good to see you again. Uh -huh. Well, hello, it's great to see everyone here. My name is Samantha Lichten. I am with the Denver Office of Climate Action, Sustainability, and Resiliency. For anyone who is a Denver voter, I just wanted to say thank you. So our office was created in 2020 because of the Citizen Ballot Initiative, um, which also raised sales tax in the city, which helps fund our office at $40 million a year. So we are very lucky and very thankful to our taxpayers as well as folks making purchases in the city helping us fund exciting programs um, like our electrification ones that we're going to be speaking about today. Um, a big reason why my office is focused on rebates and electrification programs is because 64% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from a built environment. Almost half of that is from our commercial buildings, which represent a really small fraction of the number of structures in the city. Um, and our city has pretty aggressive goals for decarbonization. We're looking at having all new buildings and homes and then all the existing buildings net zero by 2040, which means uh, there's a lot of retrofit work and a lot of projects that we're trying to start up. Uh, on the commercial side, that's my part of the Energized Denver Ordinance. So this is municipal code, which is specifically about decarbonization of our commercial and multifamily buildings. There's three components to that. There's a benchmarking requirement for buildings over 25,000 square feet, so they have to work more than energy use every year. There's a performance standard, again, for buildings over 25,000 square feet. They have to meet a certain energy use intensity target, um, so energy efficiency targets by 2030. Um, and for buildings that are 5,000 to 25,000, they have to either do a lighting retrofit or have enough solar. The last component on the commercial side is really electrification. So we've got language and code now, which basically says starting January 1, new commercial buildings with electric space and water heating um, on the new build side, and then for existing um, buildings. Starting as soon as 2025, we're looking at having changes in our code, um, which will require electrification upon the equipment replacement at end of life. Starting with easier to electrify systems, water heaters, a standalone AC units, furnaces, and then further down the line, looking at uh, more complicated systems like boilers, PTAC, and VTAX. There's a cost allocation in there for cost efficiency. We're not going to be requiring this if we can't get within 15% of the cost of a like for like replacement. Um, but as of last Monday, we now have commercial incentives for electrification and existing buildings for commercial and multifamily. Um, these are primarily going to be owner driven. So the owner is likely to be the one filling out the application for this specific program. Um, but we are covering up to $60,000 for a building um, for our standard buildings. And then we have additional rebates. You'll see all of our commercial programs. We're offering twice as much money for buildings that we consider equity priority buildings. Those include naturally uh, existing affordable housing, deed restricted affordable housing, nonprofit and human service providers, as well as places that meet certain income qualifications. Um, and the rebates are really designed to cover that incremental cost. What actually is the additional dollars that we need to provide to make up that gap? So that way, when you're looking at making the decision between a highly efficient electric system or like, like gas replacement, 
we're tipping the scales, at least so that way it's even when you're looking from a cost perspective. So for space and uh, for space heating, we have rebates for rooftop units as well as split air source heat pumps and mini split heat pumps. Um, for the rooftop units, that's up to $11,000 for a standard building, which means you can get $22,000 per rooftop unit if you're in an electric, uh, one of our equity priority buildings. On the air source heat pump side, looking at 5,500 5, for our cold climate. Um, we've also got rebates on water heating. Um, you can see the different values here associated with different levels of efficiency. Again, those rebate values are doubled if you're working with an equity priority building um, up to the project cost. And then just as a reminder, we also have residential programs. So these are our climate action rebates. We call them care rebates. And so if you're working in the residential space, looking to electrify, we have resources available um, for heat pumps, for heat pump water heaters, for solar, for storage, for EV home charging. Um, contractors are the ones who really apply for our residential rebates. And there are some requirements mostly that you either be an Excel trade partner um, or that you're a licensed electrician. And just to give you kind of an order of magnitude, we have about $25 million of rebates that we're trying to give away on the commercial side. Um, and similarly, I think we're around like 8 million for the residential. We've got a pretty healthy budget. Um, this is just some information and you guys should get the slides out just for where you can look for more information from the office. Um, I highly recommend for our commercial rebates, you look at www.denvergov.org slash building electrification rebates. As for the commercial side, um, denvergov.org slash care contractor resources will give all of the details on our residential program. Um, and lastly, we just want you all to be in touch. We want stories. We want to know how it's going. What are you seeing? Are the programs going well for you? Are you actually like making sales or making different decisions in your design because of incentives that the city is offering? Um, so if you've got any questions or feedback for the residential program, you can reach out to climate action rebate at denvergov.org. Um, if you're in the residential portal and need help with the process for that on the residential program, Denver rebate at aptum.com. And then for anything related to our multifamily and commercial program, um, you can reach out to us at electrification at denvergov.org. Um, and that's what I've got today, but I'm happy to take questions or continue the conversation over happy hour. And we've got, you probably have some questions online. Uh, do you know about rebates for other cities? Um, I know that Boulder County has pretty healthy rebate program as well. Um, and I think there might be some through like the PRPA utilities um, from Platinum Power Authority, up in Fort Collins, Walmart. Um, Tri-State, I know, also has a lot of heat bumps in there incentivizing electrification within their co-op members. Yeah. Um, There's a website called Love Electric that has basically all of the meetings that are out there. So Love Electric. Yeah. There's been popping up all over the city. I think Holy Cross has some great programs. Um, you'll see rebates from Lafada, Electric Association for folks down in Durango. Um, And are your incentives for Denver city limits only, Denver Metro? Yeah, just for city limits. It's taxpayer dollars from folks that are spending money in city limits for city limit building. But hopefully it helps spread the market and make some changes, increase availability, and break down costs for folks in the broader area. So on the, on the multi-family, do we also have to apply to get registered? Contract. So contractors do not have to be registered. Um, there is a pre-approval process, so the building owner is going to have to submit an application. Um, and the information is online at www.denvergov.org slash building electrification um, rebates. But the contractors do not have to sign up for the commercial program. That's all for now. We're uh, Thank you so much to our presenters and to our hosts. Um, we're going to do a quick lap around for those who are online and for anybody who wants to join, just a quick lap around to each uh, setup and talk about uh, like just a minute or two on the differences. So if you want to join that, feel free. Otherwise, we'll see you across the street. Uh, is our...
FS09, and I'm 09 is the capacity, it's the FS series model. This is connected in a one to one capability. Uh, in one to one, we are going to get 100% heating capacity at negative five degrees on this particular unit. So we'll be able to produce whatever it's rated to with negative five degrees. These heads can also be connected into multi zone systems. Um, using a different outdoor unit. And this particular unit, um, you kind of compare it to car trim. Uh, this would be the Escalade versus the top. It has the IC sensor, which will follow you or not follow you. It will recognize occupancy. It will recognize heat and loss gains in the room and service those parts of the room as necessary. Great unit, veins can go up, down, left, right. They can go up, down, right. Um, and generally speaking, on a one-to-one, -one, they're going to be the small, uh, people call these suitcases, uh, so just a small condenser outside. Great. Good so far? Yeah. Um, over to this uh, mock-up that we have, uh, we have a, on the back here, a 36 kilowatt, I'm sorry, 36,000 BTU kilowatts, that's wrong. Uh, it's an outdoor unit, it's multi-zone. Um, we'll make one penetration into the home, and that's going to feed our branch box here. The homeowner will likely never see that these usually sit in a crawl space, a mechanical room, or an attic. From there, we can connect again just about any head inside the Mitsubishi product line. Here we have a one ton air handler. Um, this would help you with indoor air quality, humidification, cleaning, etc., because we'll have a return air path. Um, we've got on here also a floor unit, uh, floor mounted. These can actually be recessed if you want to show. Uh, this here can actually be recessed into the wall, making its footprint off the wall only this much instead of that much. Um, very, very good units in regards to things with vaulted ceilings, um, upstairs of bungalows, things of those nature. Um, these things do very well. Quick heat recovery too. Yeah, very quick heat recovery because we are pulling our return from the floor as well. Uh, where most of the rest of these were pulling our return air from the ceiling. Uh, this is an SVZ. SVZ? Yeah. SVZ. Um, there's two models of these SVZ and PEAD. Um, this is what we would call a low static, meaning that we have a little bit of a limited duct run if we're going to actually duct it. Um, that's easy. Sorry. Um, the PEAD gives us a little bit more static pressure, so we can make a little bit longer duct runs. So something like this, we've maybe got about 10 to 15 feet total of duct uh, that we can use. The PEAD, we're probably going to get up to like 30 to 50 feet of duct that we can use, depending on bent and such. Uh, but these are typically used to service... Um, like I see them in like Jack and Jill bedrooms, um, primary bedrooms, and bathrooms. Uh, you can zone out like a kitchen and living room using one piece. Um, things like that is kind of how you got to think. Um, this is running right now. I don't know if you guys can hear that or not, but it's incredibly quiet. We're standing here just talking to our normal voices. Uh, so from an outdoor standpoint, sitting on the patio, you're not making your neighbors mad. You're keeping your guests happy. All that good stuff. Move along. Um, this is a commercial application. It's missing the grill, um, but this would be a four-way ceiling set. It's a three by three foot footprint. Um, so you'd be looking at things like a conference room, uh, drop ceilings is where these fit very well. Um, these come with or without an IC sensor, similar to the FS head, so you can, it can uh, seek out what needs to be serviced in the room and will adapt accordingly. Um, this one's set up in a one-to-one -one application, heat pump, or straight air conditioning. Um, yeah, it has its own lift mechanisms for condensate, so you put on your condensate tubing here, which is coming out right here, actually, sorry. Um, it's got about 21 inches of lift and will drain out no accessories needed. On you can set the veins to work in four directions, two directions, three directions, one direction. You can put it in the hallway and just service this way. You can put it in the other room and service this way. Yeah. Um, these, we don't see a whole lot of them, but they do have their place. Uh, these would be used in things like restaurants, uh, for air conditioning. Um, they work very, very well. Large space, large capacity cooling. Um, again, the PUY is a cooling only outdoor unit. 
Uh, and this happens to be a two ton unit as well. Um, so kitchens, restaurants, conference rooms, uh, things of that nature, waiting rooms, lobbies, and so on. Good opportunity. There. Uh, this particular unit looks very similar to the FS we started with. This is a PKA, uh, it's part of our P series. Um, the P series is more of a commercial, a uh, little bit more robust system. It's designed to run 24 7, 365. And these are going to give uh, really low ambient cooling, again, kind of for those banks, server rooms, restaurants, um, things where things inside the building are going to cause a heat load, even though we might be in the middle of winter. Um, we're going to be able to provide cooling capabilities out of this down to, I believe it's negative, uh, negative 10 degrees, you can still provide cooling. Uh, and these are all going to be one-to-one -one applications. So we would have one compressor outside. Um, this unit is our MSZ GL. I'm going back to the first unit we started with, the FS. Um, I called that the FS, the Escalade. This is the Tahoe. Um, performance factor, very, very, very similar. Um, not quite as low ambient heating, um, but it's really just the same kind of head without the bells and whistles, a little bit more economic depending on the situation. Um, these come up to, I believe, uh, two and a half to three tons these days. And you're able to, you know, a large open floor plan home, this one unit may be able to provide cooling capabilities for that whole home out of this one indoor head. And then we have one more to go. This unit, if you look underneath, uh, is our MLC. It's a one way ceiling cassette, uh, meaning that it blows its uh, discharge air down and out. It doesn't do both ways yet. I believe that's a product improvement coming in the next couple of years. This is probably our second most popular unit that we sell because the only thing the homeowner is going to see in the bedroom is from here to here they're going to see that half inch grill it's going to service the whole room we have sizes in half ton for bedrooms uh, all the way up to ton and a half which can service um, pretty large living rooms uh you know probably like a living room kitchen on a ton and a half depending on the size of the room of course but um a ton and a half you are probably be looking at approaching 800 to 1000 square feet the right capabilities um, serviced by one very well concealed head. Again, uh, has its own lip mechanism in it for condensate. From an install standpoint, that works out very well. And we just plumb it out into our wet wall and be on our way. Great. Well, thank you very much. You got me. All right. Thank you all. We'll go good day. And that'll do it for today's broadcast. We'll catch you next time. Thanks.